So today I want to take a different approach and, and our other two presenters were exceptional. I'm going to ask you for copies of your presentations because I can use them in, in my own reporting as well. I've been a journalist for about 20 years. So clearly I started at the age of two <laughs> because I can't be older than 22, right? I, I could be your colleague. <laughs> and this has given me tremendous opportunity to live history and to see some of the developments that are happening before our eyes. So when economists speak about the different things that are happening and the factors in the Caribbean, I get to actually experience the impact of the investments and the impact of the changes that are going on, and I get to report on them on a day-to-day -day basis. So today I want to talk to you about the next big wave, investment opportunities in the Caribbean. Anybody here in finance? couple people. Anybody here is an investor, you invest in stock market, um, anything like that? All right, couple people as well. Young people, you need to get started because when I was your age, I wish I had known the things I know now. I would have been rich. Like when, when they called, I would be like, mm, no thanks. Um, so, you know, margarita under a tree somewhere. I can't bother to get up and, you know, <laughs> leave. So start investing. And I'm going to tell you about some investment opportunities in the Caribbean right now that a lot of people outside of the region don't know about. So where do I move the slide? This is a... Okay, here we go. So starting with Jamaica, which is a very interesting case study in recent history and economic development. <coughs> so for decades, Jamaica was the poster child of unsustainability, of high debt, of, you know, just, what is that? There's so many phrases when they talk about Jamaica. Um, people say, you know, I love living here, but there are all these issues in living here, all these social issues. The country is highly indebted, and they have gone through multiple programs with the IMF to the extent that there's even been a whole documentary called Life and Debt, D-E-B-T, focusing on Jamaica's tumultuous relationship with the IMF. And although we like to blame multilateral organizations like that for the island's problems and for some of the region's problems, we also have to acknowledge the role that our own governments and our own politicians and our own people have played in making it what it is. Of course, there's our colonial past. We can't not acknowledge that too. But also there's been corruption. There's been some teething of money, and there's been misappropriation. Back in the day, there was a politician named Omar Davies, Dr. Omar Davies, who was the finance minister of Jamaica for a period under the People's National Party, and his famous uh, phrase, his famous tagline was, run with it, because money was rolling, even though the country was highly in debt. He still said, run with it, and that, becomes famous, that became his famous tagline. And so the country had decades of very, very high debt to the point that by 2010, Jamaica's debt, Jamaica was the second most highly indebted nation in the entire world behind Greece. And the debt reached levels of 145% of GDP. Now, what does that even mean? So GDP, gross domestic product, is the total of everything that the country produces. So how much, does, how much money does the country make in a year? So think of it like your annual salary. When you get a job, you make this amount of money. However, how much debt does the country have? So debt to GDP uh, measures how much debt they have compared to how much they make. So debt to GDP being at 145% means that they owed more than they made in an entire year, essentially. And as I think Dr. Lewis was the one, or it might have been um, Dr. Drew, is Jones? John. John. One of you guys mentioned, you know, what's the sustainable level is for debt, it's about 60%. And Jamaica was at 145%. And so after going through all these cycles and, you know, these programs with the IMF, and it just never works, including conditionalities, meaning you have to um, reduce wages for public sector workers, wage freeze, you have to um, put a freeze on new infrastructure so you don't have money to, to build and so on, to build schools and to fix roads. 
And there's so many things that the country had to do. And each time they went through this program, they failed. Partly because of the harsh conditions, right? But when you look at the numbers as well, all of this debt was not owed to these multilateral institutions as much as we like to blame them. So Jamaica's total debt at the time was 19 billion US dollars. But more than half of that, 10 billion was actually owed to local investors. So you have your banks, your pension funds, your institutional investors, your ordinary people who invest in what they call government paper. Now, because the government was not the most reliable person to lend money to, because who knows, they might default because they have so much other debt, there's a high risk that they're not going to pay back. So in order to make government paper attractive to investors, what do they have to do? Anybody can guess? Our economics major? To make it attractive, what do they have to do? Raise the interest rates. They have to offer extremely high interest rates. And so interest rates in Jamaica on government paper, these are treasury bills, bonds, and so on, was as high as 25, 30, 35%. So you can earn a ridiculous return by investing with the government because they're a terrible client. And because I'm not, I don't want to risk my money with you because you might not pay me back. So for me to take that risk, you have to offer an extremely high interest rate. But what was the impact of that? The impact of that is that now institutional investors, banks and so on are saying, well, why should I invest in the local economy? Why should I invest in your business? Why should I even lend you money to build a house or buy a house? when I can just get 25% interest rate from the government by buying government paper. And it became extremely expensive. Mortgages were expensive. Business lending was expensive. And that situation is called crowding out. So because the government offered such extremely high and unsustainable uh, offers, government paper, they crowded out investment in other areas of the economy. So now I can't get a business loan because why would they lend to me when they can just get 25-30% interest back from the government, crowding out. And let's also mention that at the peak of Jamaica's debt problem, debt servicing was 50% of the budget. 50% of the budget. So now, out of all the money I make, I only have half to pay teachers, pay police, train doctors and nurses and build roads and fix roads and build schools and all the other things that the government is responsible for doing. And the other half goes straight back to paying those ridiculous interest rates and paying back all the debt that the government owes. So at its peak, we had one trillion, that's Jamaican dollars, dollars in local debt. And so this was the local debt portion, 10 billion, more than half was uh, owed to people locally. Enter JDX and NDX, which I covered extensively as a reporter. These were part of the IMF agreement, the latest one at the time, because remember, Jamaica went through many wrongs with the IMF. So one of the conditions of this agreement was that Jamaica do a debt swap. So JDX stood for Jamaica Debt Exchange. NDX was the second round in 2012, which stood for National Debt Exchange. And so what they asked the government to do was exchange those high interest notes with lower interest notes. So investors, and remember, these were a lot of local investors because they didn't ask the, the international investors to do that. Shit. They asked the local investors to take a haircut on their interest payments. And so that was one of the conditions. They said that you have to freeze public sector wages and so many different things that the government had to implement. But guess what? It actually worked this time. It finally worked. Who knew when Jamaica suddenly became the poster child for the IMF saying, okay, if we implement IMF reforms, this is what can be the result. After decades of uh, you know, fighting this fight, it finally begun, began to work. And so what we start seeing now, now what happens to all those wealthy people, the local investors, who they're not getting 25% interest from the government anymore, 
they now need a new place to put their money because they still want to get attractive returns, but they're not getting it from the government anymore, from government paper. Where do they put it? A lot of them turn to the local stock exchange. And what is a stock exchange except a place for you to invest in businesses? So you now become a shareholder in local companies. And when they earn a profit, you earn a percentage in dividends, right? So a lot of these people turn to the local stock exchange. And by 2015, you started seeing headlines like this. It's jamming. Jamaica's tiny stock market conquers the world in 2015. Because all this money now is going into the stock exchange. Well, a lot of it, um, actually. So you see companies were doubling in value. You see... Dolphin Cove and Carib Cement, their stock prices were up. And then again in 2018, Jamaica was also the number one performing stock exchange in the world. So here we had another Bloomberg headline, the Financial Times. Everybody was covering this amazing story. 80% growth in 2015 on the stock exchange, 27% in 2016, 35% in 2018, and you had companies reporting that. Was this Financial Times? It might have been reporting that in those five years, the local stock exchange reported 500% growth. Now, I just want you to put this in context since most of you aren't investors. That means your average study here is what, four years? All right, let's pretend that it's five years. That means if you started as a freshman and you invested $100 in one of these companies, let's, let's use a bigger number, 100 will be as impressive. Let's say you had $10,000, right, to invest. You started as a freshman. By the time you were finished college, after the five years, that $10,000 would be worth $50,000 without you having to do anything. That's just your average return, meaning there were outliers that were even higher than that. We had one, country, one company, Barita, that their return in 2018 was 800% in one single year. So if you invested $100 in Barita in January, by December, that $100 was worth $800. $1,000 was worth $8,000 by the end of the year. And so you are seeing phenomenal growth. And then at the same time, we started seeing the debt going down. So from the 145% in 2010, you start seeing the chart showing that debt is going down and down and down because the government is not paying down the debt. They got more aggressive with paying it down. They're managing the economy a lot better. And the projections are now that Jamaica will be at that sustainable level, 60% by 2027, which is only four years away. And then we also see unemployment sliding to record lows. We're now at 4.5%, so it's lower than what the chart actually shows. Which is good for us, might not be good by US numbers, but for us it is good because we've seen unemployment at 15% when we were covering in 2010. 15-16% unemployment was normal, now we're down to about 4.5. And then we also have received ratings upgrades from the major international credit ratings agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's and & Fitch, which in turn means that we can get better credit. Because if anybody, anybody has a credit card here, anybody ever applied for a loan, you guys are young, so maybe, maybe you haven't applied for a loan, but you know the concept of a credit score, right? So if you have a good credit score, you're going to get better offers, you're going to get lower interest rates, meaning that you don't have to pay back as much. So Jamaica's credit score is improving, which means you can get better deals on loans, we can refinance. So a lot of that high interest debt that we had, the government is now refinancing to lower interest debt, which means that we have less repayments to make, which means that there is more money for the government to spend on roads and schools and paying police and training teachers and all the things that the government needs to do with their money. And it's been, it's been quite a ride witnessing the economic change in Jamaica so being there to see physically the landscape change, to see the buildings go up that didn't exist. You said this lot used to be empty. Now there's a multi-story building going up. Jamaica still does have a lot of problems, but I can genuinely say that I see improvements being made. And now we see young entrepreneurs aspiring to list on the local stock exchange. 
people aspiring to be entrepreneurs so that they can list on the stock exchange and you know have that exit if they so choose, which is a conversation that we weren't having 10 years ago. However, January 2023, Usain Bolt, anybody know this person? Looks familiar to the world, right? <laughs> Well, a big scandal erupted at his investment firm, SSL, Stocks and Securities Limited. This was all over the international press, the screenshot taken from CNN. And his investment advisor was accused of stealing almost 13 million US dollars from his investment account. Which, and the headline was, there was another headline saying, um, Bolt's entire retirement money is gone. And Bolt is broke, and there was a lot of, and Bolt is a national icon. Bolt is a global icon, but imagine in Jamaica, his iconic status is amplified. Everybody loves you, say, right? We saw him, we cried with him when he won the medals and he did the, the, the to the world, 9.58 to all that. And so for somebody to steal you, say, Bolt's money is a big national scandal. And so now everybody starts saying, well, they start turning to me because I'm the one who's always on TikTok telling people to invest their money and go to the Jamaica Stock Exchange and so on and so on. People start saying, well, Kabila, why are you always telling me to invest? Uh, but look how that thief bought money. Why should I invest when, you know, this happens to somebody like Usain Bolt? And he wasn't the only victim. There were other victims as well. But he's just the most well-known. So everybody related to him and made it a vulnerable. And so this became a national scandal, and to this day, the market hasn't recovered. So the market took a dive, and a lot of people lost confidence in the local stock exchange, which resulted in stock prices falling. We start seeing some recovery creeping back in. But what I do know is that these things work in cycles. Investments always have cycles. You have up cycles, you have down cycles, you have bull markets, you have bear markets. I still think there is tremendous opportunity for investment in Jamaica. And scandals like this happen all over the world, especially here in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. You hear about it all the time. It's not unique to Jamaica. It's unfortunate, but I do think that there is room for recovery. And what it does present for somebody from an investment perspective is a unique buying opportunity because now the stock prices are much lower than they ordinarily would be, right? So the next one I want to look at is... Guyana, any Guyanese in the house? Yes, I know we have in the front another. What are Jamaicans? Woo! Okay, I didn't call you out earlier. Hey, all right, so Guyana, and you would have heard portions of my presentation in a previous presentation as well. So Guyana is now experiencing rapid economic growth. Guyana has been one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere for several decades suffering from you know, high levels of poverty, low per capita GDP, low GDP in general. But all of a sudden, that number is wrong. Why do I have 2006? Oh, yes, for so the whole chart, okay, to 2028. All of a sudden, we're starting to see this rapid growth in Guyana. 62% economic growth in 2022 which is an astounding figure, especially considering a few years ago, Jamaica's grand ambition was to achieve 5% economic growth in four years. Five and four was this big government slogan. They got 62% in one year. And the projection for this year is 38%. So why? Crickets. Three letters. NBC saying it could reach... 100%. O. I. I. L. Oil. So you would have heard some of this in the previous presentation. Guyana is currently producing 380,000 barrels of oil a day. The oil was discovered in commercial quantities there in, what year was it again? 20, 2015. They're now producing 380,000 barrels a day. The projection is that that will go up to 1.2 million barrels a day by 2027. The government has collected $1.6 billion in revenue so far, which represents one-third of the entire national budget. 
So one out of every three dollars that the Guyanese government earns comes directly from the oil industry. Should this be more? Absolutely it should. The conditions of that oil concession agreement are not great. Actually, they're, they're, they're bad, <laughs> as you would have heard in the previous presentation. But still, we can't deny the impact of what the oil has already meant for Guyana. So Guyana is now poised to become one of the largest oil-producing countries in the world, placing it ahead of Qatar, the United States, Mexico, and Norway. So just think about the impact of that. And what so far has the government done or is the government planning to do with all this new money? Well, so far they've launched infrastructure projects, they plan to build 12 hospitals, 7 hotels, several schools, 2 main highways, the first deep water port, and so on and so forth. What does that mean for ordinary people? It means, because, all right, so there's this big debate about, oh, but then Guyanese people aren't working in the oil industry. But you have to realize this impacts the entire economy, not just the oil. because they don't have many opportunities at home for good paying jobs. So they come to places like the United States to find better jobs. But now with this economic transformation that is set to happen, well, there are going to be some more jobs for Guyanese back home and more jobs for other Caribbean people who want to live in that country as well. But is it all pretty? Absolutely not. Because this has also increased tensions, including political and racial tensions in Guyana. So Guyana, for those of you who don't know, has two main ethnic groups, people of African descent and people of Indian descent, and their political structure is also divided along those lines. And so you have the party that has a lot of Africans and the party that has a lot of Indians. And when it comes down to the politics, it gets very, very tense because it's along ethnic lines. And so the 2020 election was definitely one for the books, especially because both parties knew what was on the line. Now that they have this new oil industry and all these discoverable barrels of oil and how much money that's going to bring in, they were going to fight down to the tooth and nail to make sure they had the opportunity to be the party that is in charge of all this new wealth. And so it came down to one single seat. The election was won by one single seat. It was that close. And of course, the losing party went to court to challenge the result, and then the other side refused to give up the thing, and it was a whole mess for several months. Ghana didn't really have an effective government because it was languishing in court because of all of this that was happening. And then on top of that, so eventually Irfan Ali was sworn in as president. And on top of that, this big territorial dispute started rearing its head again. So Guyana and Venezuela have for centuries had this territorial dispute, which Guyana says was resolved many, many years ago because this dispute was inherited from colonial days, was a dispute between Spain and England. Spain being the colonizer of Venezuela, England being the colonizer of Guyana. Uh, Venezuela claims that this entire region in orange is theirs. Uh, it technically belongs to Guyana. Um, and these borders have been established internationally for decades, yet Venezuela still claims this region. And why, of course, do they claim this region now? Why, why all of a sudden they come back with this claim? Because of the oil. Venezuela is also a major oil producing state, which should have been an indication, Dr. Lewis, that there is likely oil in Guyana. And Grenada. And, oh, Grenada too? Oh, Grenada. Oh, look, look at how close they are. Trinidad, that little boot right there is Trinidad. Trinidad is oil producing. Venezuela have oil. So, of course, in the, in the concession agreements and the prospecting agreements, it should have been better written in Guyana's favor because the chances of finding oil were high, given that all its neighbors also have oil. 
Um, so that should have been done better. But the point is that now we have territorial agreements coming in. So there's a threat of political instability. There's the threat of regional instability. And it's not all fun and roses for the Guyanese people. There are people who are complaining that they're not yet seeing the effects of the country's new oil wealth. Will it ever reach them? Will it trickle down? I don't know. Will the projects that the government promised actually happen? Will there be massive corruption and they just thief the money? Let's see what happens. But I do believe that there are opportunities in both of these countries, a lot of economic opportunities, especially for those of you Caribbean students here who, you know, you came directly from the Caribbean and you're considering whether you should stay here or go back home after you finish your Collective Pretty Princeton degree. Um, there are some opportunities for you. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for having me. This question is for any of the panelists. Each of you has very, very brilliantly outlined the problems and the and and what one should not do as a as a small state in our region. Can you perhaps suggest a model that might work? The only one I can think of right now, and again, the scale is very different, is Rwanda, mm -hmm. which has decided that it is not going to have certain um, international incursions into its economy. But you may have other models that might be more helpful towards the Car to the Caribbean. I'm looking at the economists in the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, a model that might work. No, I, I think I think that we should think about a model together. Mm -hmm. I think we should go about this differently rather than you know, as I said. Send to people, start with what you think people value, right? And I don't know if it's investment to so the few people who have money who can invest in the stock exchange and, you know, get more money so the GDP looks great. But then, as Tanisha says, most of the GDP went to two people, right? Mm -hmm. So th there's a question of what do you look at to judge prosperity? Mm -hmm. But Belize is, an, is a good example, Leave the oil in the ground. Who is benefiting most from the oil? ExxonMobil has made the highest amount of profits in this 150 years of operation in Guyana. The Guyanese government, yeah, it's got money. What? What the GDP? A quarter? One third. A third. But it still has to borrow money for the investment. So it hasn't been reaping that windfall that Exxon is, is, is um, reaping. And we never do that based on the mounting costs, especially as they expand more, more oil fields. We are also looking at the exploitation of the seabed, right? Which Jamaica has already run ahead in this new mood of Jamaican doing well to form a company to help explore the seabed to, to um, mine it in a context where we don't know the effects of these things. And I just want us to be more thoughtful and mindful. And my charge to you is not to think about making money. Of course, we all want a good and decent life, but think about what a good life should be. Think about other people. Are we invested in models that have a few people at the top? Reflected globally, so you have a few billionaires and the majority of, of people are hardly earning a living wage. Think about what kind of world we want. And I think that if we think about that, then we will come up with a model that works for us. So, <laughs> we have some slightly different, different, some slight differences of opinion. Um, one, Looking at the Belize model, because I'm from Belize and I studied Belizean politics and economics as well, I guarantee you that if the scale of the oil that was found in Belize was on the scale of what was found in Guyana, they would be digging up the whole of Belize right now. I, I guarantee that that is it. So the scale of the oil that was found in Belize in what, about 2008, thereabouts, 2005, I think it was, um, was nowhere near that scale. It was a very small quantity. And if it was a huge scale, I don't know that our leaders would have been as altruistic to say leave the oil in the ground. 
Now, when it comes to stock market investing and the pursuit of personal wealth and economic growth and economic development, I take a different approach because I used to be that person who said, um, I don't want to be rich. I don't, I don't need to be wealthy. I just want to be happy. But as you grow up and you start paying bills and you realize how much health insurance costs and how much a mortgage costs and how much it costs to have your own vehicle it, and how much it costs to come to Princeton, <laughs> I mean, you realize that you kind of need to be a little wealthy in order to, to enjoy these things and that. And it's not even living an extravagant life. Just buying a regular house these days, you need to be rich to do. Just buying a regular vehicle, coming to a nice university, having your kids be comfortable. Health insurance is something here in America that you kind of need to be wealthy to access. And so that's why I encourage people to start investing to create personal wealth and generational wealth as well. And there's this big misconception that um, investing is only for wealthy, for the rich people. And that's not true because investing is actually how you get wealthy. It's how you become wealthy. In Jamaica, for example, you have most of the stocks listed on the stock exchange cost less than 100 Jamaican dollars each, which is $7 US. You can buy one stock and start and go up from there. It doesn't require wealth to purchase 10 stocks of NCB, which is the largest commercial bank in the company, and become an investor and a shareholder and receive dividends and be able to reap the capital appreciation. So I believe in terms of an economic model that works, I believe stock markets investing, for example, and having regional stock markets and maybe integrating more of our regional stock markets is a way that can lead to economic development for all of us because A, it helps the individual create personal wealth for themselves and their families. B, it gives access to capital, to businesses that need capital to grow and develop. And then in turn, C, those businesses pay taxes to the government, which gives the government more revenue. Thank you so much. That is a lot to think about. Um, we are running a little bit late and we want to make sure we have time for lunch. So we're going to take one more question and then we will wrap up speakers first. Can I just respond back to that question as well? Please do. I will be fast in my response because Guyana and Jamaica are being spoken about. And then also some of the things that were mentioned were included in my initial presentation. But since I knew I was being long winded, I couldn't address it. One. Between 2021 and 2022, ExxonMobil made $6 billion from the oil it extracted from Guyana and gave the government $500 million. They made $6 billion with a B and gave the government $500 million. Effectively, that was $0 since Guyana had to cover the research and associated costs with the ExxonMobil fine. And so that is why in Guyana, you have had for the past six years sustained protests against the oil industry from indigenous people, African people, and Indian people in Guyana. And so I think that that is very important because currently environmental laws in Guyana that are the most progressive in South America are being challenged by ExxonMobil, aided <coughs> by corrupt politicians in the country, and they are going up to the international court soon. And so that is something that people should be looking out for. Second is that in Jamaica, as in a lot of other Caribbean countries, you do have it where local debt, AKA private debt is very high. However, that local designation is false and only exists because it is labeled as private. National Commercial Bank in Jamaica, for instance, since you have Canadian banks pulling out of the region, is seen as a national Jamaican bank. However, the interim CEO is a Canadian from Scotia Bank CEO group. And so these local designations are false because the major shareholders continue to be foreigners outside of the Caribbean region. And second, if we want to think about a model that might work for the Caribbean, we have to center the people first and see what they want. Why is it that we're saying Guyana is now the richest GDP in the Caribbean and most of the people in Guyana say that oil is not going to help them? A survey. Why is it not going to help them? And then you have to go from there. You can't use these top down approaches directed by foreign dominance over these industries and sectors. Uh, yes, you can ask your question. So I really, really appreciate this um, 
discussion and unfortunately the mic landed on me and I probably won't be quick. But <laughs> <laughs> Professor um, Lewis, your central question in terms of um, what are the principles that we want to adhere to when we think about what development and what growth in our, our, our region looks like? I know that there, um, one of the, the amazing things about this, this panel is the, the kind of tensions that have just come out in, in the discussion. And I'm going to um, chalk that up somewhat to uh, Kalida being 22. <laughs> I'm going to stick to the age you gave. Because, um, and this, this I'm, I'm fascinated by it because this is what my dissertation research is, is centered on. Um, looking at the way that uh, the type of uh, Caribbean principles for development that were being uh, discussed as like original and indigenous to the Caribbean in the 1960s have to find other means of re-emerging after the 1980s because of the dominance of globalization as development and structural adjustment policies. And I'm looking at it from the literary lens and how the Caribbean women writers are crafting these principles because the discussions are happening. They're just not always happening in front of us. But I also think that what Kalila is getting at that is very relevant to everybody in, in this room is the way that there is very limited opportunity. And so I think that there needs to be a straddling of the both and we cannot neglect personal um, prosperity because it is so easy for every generation behind millennials. I'm a millennial to slip into actual abject poverty. And this extends across America and the Caribbean. And I think that's probably the tension that is emerging. But at the same time, one of the things I appreciate about Dr. John and Dr. Lewis is that the structures that have caused these slippages cannot just remain. So we can't actually be individually invested in our, our prosperity alone because what we're gonna do is take from the, the continuing generations, right? And so the, the, the cycle is going to continue because the very structures that we are investing our money in are structures of foreign direct investment that benefit foreign institutes and companies and don't quote unquote trickle down to the rest of, of the Caribbean. So it's important that if we are invested in, if the IMF is invested in democracy, what are the Guyanese voices saying? And there is a very popular movement against oil extraction in the country. So we can't just have the conversation on one front. Anyway, the actual question I wanted to ask was <laughs> <laughs> the, the possibility of developing our own metrics that speak to some of the things that um, Professor Lewis was, was indicating in terms of or dominant models of development and mainstream development discourse prioritize market expansion, foreign direct investment, and extraction. Extraction through um, mining and extraction through um, uh, privatization and um, tourism, which is a, a kind of extraction from the region. Is there a way for us to develop our own indicators that account for the fact that mining from the ground is actually taking a, a resource that, that, is, that is limited that oil extraction threatens the entire Ghanaian ecological system, which is extremely important because the Amazon is the breathing heart of, of the world and part of the Amazon is in Ghana. And so the, the idea that we can speak about these things as solely good things because we don't have our own economic indicators and we don't have our own economic language or development discourse to, to kind of reframe the, these things is a part of the problem and probably the tension that's happening on this um, panel. So what would be the indicators that each of you would come up with in if we had to have our own, say, GDP? What, what, are, what are some of the indicators that we could come up with that could, can reflect our values? I think we need, we need uh, more time to reflect on that. And I don't know, just throwing out things is going to help. I don't have a problem with people being competent. I'm talking about the, con the global concentration of wealth in the hands of very few people and the devil take the high most. So I'm not saying that people should be comfortable, like everybody should be comfortable. But coming to your question, and I don't want to answer it the way you asked it, but if you think about bauxite in, in, in Jamaica, how did the bauxite people get companies make money and the people who found the land and owned the land from generations didn't? because the inequality is baked into the colonial agreement they inherited, which they haven't changed, which says 
that you only own the soil. You don't own what's beneath it, uh, beneath it and you don't own what, uh, what is above it. So they could move ordinary Jamaican people off the land and just give it up, compensating them for the bauxite underneath. So there are all of these ways in which people are shafted, mm -hmm. poor people are exploited, that I think we need to start to see. Forget GDP. Let's, when we talk about GDP, let's go to where GDP is going. We haven't looked at Jamaica's G Gini coefficient yet. Mm -hmm. The Caribbean is among the most high, most in unequal countries in the world with Latin America, right? So we have to, that's part of the picture. And it's how we read it. How do we read human development? The world is in a bad way. Let me just say, if we're looking good. Because when it comes to education, they look at complete primary, right? That's a low bar. Quality of education also doesn't come into the picture. Healthcare. How much of us have access to quality healthcare in the region? So I think that we need, again, we need to have a sense of what We're passionate about, so I'm very happy that you, you have this conference here. And I'm also very happy that I'm able to share a panel with people thinking about what the economic situation in the Caribbean looks like and how it can better be improved. It would be nice if the Caribbean had a stock exchange where most of the invest investors were local because they had money and capital that could develop the Caribbean. How do we make that the case, right? Don't take these things as is and that should be it because you don't want to build on top of what is already exploiting us, we want to think about how we can take over ownership because ownership matters. Ownership. So on, on her point of ownership and also to piggyback on, on the previous comment, one of the things that we need to do in the Caribbean is to own the value add. So one of our big problems is that we have all these natural resources that are being extracted and moved somewhere else, but then the other people own the value add. So the raw petroleum isn't primarily valuable until you convert it into fuel and natural gas and all these amazing products. Uh, raw bauxite, what do you do with that? Well, when you convert it into aluminum, 
now is an extremely valuable product that can build airplanes, right? But we don't have the resources now to own the value add. We don't own the value add. So we sell the raw product, and the person who converts the raw product into the, the valuable thing is the person who makes the lion's share of the money. And so in Guyana's case, you have the oil, you have the raw product, but now we need to own the refineries. And the question is, why is that? Why don't we control the value add? <laughs> Why don't we own the? Yeah, we need to own the refinery. Yeah, we need to own the value added with the bottle. And on that note, I think we are going to end. <laughs> Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>